My name is Nadia Parfan. I'm a Kyiv-based film director and writer, and I'm presenting a short film, It's a Date, at Berlinale this year. It is a story of the city at war, where life continues in all its dimensions, and it's a story of love in the city in a country at war. Welcome to the Teddy TV. My name is Jean Borbobak, and this time we are talking about the film It's a Date. Hi, welcome to the Teddy. Welcome to Berlinale. Thank you so much for being here with us, for uh, taking the time um, to discuss the film. Um, let's get into it. Um, what was the idea that that started rolling this project? What was your initial drive to make the film. Hi everyone, hello Berlinale and the Teddy team. I was thinking about this film for quite a while. Um, it started when my husband bought a motorbike and I became a motorbike passenger and I realized that the way you see the city from a motorbike passenger seat is absolutely amazing, uh -huh. like nothing else and also very very cinematic. And as I was riding with him, I was basically constantly watching a movie and I was trying to make this film, to find a way to make it, but it never came together. Yet after the full scale Russian invasion, I think I re-evaluated my relationship with the city, with Kyiv city, the capital of Ukraine on the one hand, because it was almost occupied a year ago. It on February 24th, 22. At the same time, uh, the story shifted a little bit because a lot of queer people joined the Ukrainian army and became defenders, soldiers. And some of them have their loved ones back at home yet because Ukraine has not yet recognized the same-sex partnership. Um, they have different rights. Basically, they don't have the rights that the soldier's family has. So if you get killed, if you are found missing, if something happens to you at the front line, and if you're an LGBT person, your partner might not be able even to get your body, which is tragic. And, and I have a lot of friends who are in the army and a lot of uh, LGBT friends. So I, these two stories, the story of the city and the story of this love in the war time mm. came together and I felt like I just have to do this and I have to do it now and we did it. Yeah, amazing. Um, th the film is in a way um, a, a, a sort of remake of, of a 1970s um, French film made by Claude Lelouch. Um, what is your relationship to this film and, um, and and how was it to rework it in this very particular context in which your film, It's a Date, plays? I would call this an homage to mm -hmm. Claude Lelouch. I love his film and uh, when I, as I told you, I was riding on a motorbike as a passenger. Yeah. It's like you're really just enjoying because you don't have to be focused. And I recalled that film, I recalled Lelouch, uh, and I was thinking, if I put this story in Ukrainian context, what kind of story is it? So it is in a way the rethinking of Lelouch and of Paris. Uh, to me, this is, Lelouch is about the 20th century love story with an adventurous man who likes speed, who is cool, who is very masculine perhaps, and then there is this tender blonde girl waiting for him. Yeah. It's uh, it's like this model of relationship and love. 
And my film is uh, this story, but set in a 21st century, taking place in Kyiv. I would say the new capital of Europe, the new capital of freedom, the uh, the heart, the heart of this region, and also a different kind of relationship, a relationship of two women, and one of them. She's a woman, she's feminine, but she's also a soldier, a fighter, a defender. And she's not just, you know, adventurous for quick riding, although she obviously likes it. But she has a reason, a very specific reason to rush, to be in a hurry. Because when you're a soldier, when you are at war, you're always short of time. And when you come to the city, to the civilian place, you have very, very little time to see your loved one and you value every minute. So you really need to hurry. You need to rush. And it's like the new uh, speed means something different and speedy driving means something different. And the date, I think, means something different. People who are at the front line appreciate their dates so, so much. Yeah, that's that's for sure. And I mean, probably it's also more universally true in a in a in a war zone in a in a situation of war it's not necessarily only soldiers but everybody who is living in that particular reality time and and the date has a different weight than um than in any other kind of context for sure okay so please tell us a bit about the the process of production because obviously with a film like this that's a very exciting element uh, how did you realize the film i don't drive and that was the biggest irony of this film that i have no clue about driving mm. and cars i'm just a film director and i have my passions and dreams uh, so in the beginning i took my friend who is into driving and who likes to drive fast and we were doing a set of tests with him we would mount all kinds of little cameras, GoPros, and test the route and just prepare all kinds of things because I realized that it's not going to be easy. And uh, ironically, his driving license was taken away uh, oh, in the no. middle of his test, not during one of those, not during, just yeah. like to be sure, but it wasn't quite legal, to be honest, that we were driving really fast. Uh, but with uh, obviously keeping safety measures. And then I have this wonderful um, director of photography whom I love to work with, Dennis Marinek. And I said, look, Dennis, I have this dream. I want to make this and I need you to help me understand how, how do we visualize this? And as Dennis was thinking, he comes up with this one guy. He's like, look, there is just one guy in Ukraine who can help us do this the right way. We need to have him on board. And I'm like, okay, okay, you know these directors of photography, they like, like their favorite lens and camera yeah. and their favorite guy, the grip guy. But I trust him, so I'm like, okay, let's go to see your guy. And uh, this guy is called Max. We called him Crazy Max. And he it's really on, uh, on the backstage. It looks like the Mad Max film. Uh -huh. uh, it's the steampunk uh, facility that he mounted and that he engineered specifically for our film. But then the crazy Max, the Max, Max is asking me, look, but who is going to drive? And I'm like, oh, well, I have this friend. He's a very good driver. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm not letting my thing be driven by your friend, by the random guy. It needs to be a professional. And there is just one guy in Ukraine who can make it. And wow. I'm like, oh, my God, just one guy who wants another one guy. Yeah. OK, let's look at your one guy. And they bring me a stuntman. And uh, the crazy Max says, it's only this stuntman whom I allow to drive this whole facility. And I was like, oh, my God, these production people, they are so capricious. And like, why is it going to be so complicated every time? But then when we had this first meeting with the stuntman, uh, he became my favorite guy on earth. And it really saved lives, mm -hmm. nerves. And he actually made this film. This guy is a true genius. So we are spoiling it a little bit here, but 
it's a true speed and it's a true drive. There is no post-production speed correction. Uh, it drives really fast, like 180 kilometers. And uh, when I first sat with him uh, in the car, he's like, take a belt and uh -huh. fasten it very well because it's going to be like this. Yeah. But, uh, with him, it's a combination of risk, a real and crazy risk, but also a lot of safety because the guy is, he's a genius. He's very professional and yeah. he knows, uh, he knows what the risk smells like. He knows when to risk and when to stop. Uh, he was a bit upset because I think we bumped into something, uh, one of the takes, and we broke his car, <laughs> his oh, favorite no. car. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, I'm his fan. He does all these crazy tricks. He can, you know, like the yeah. proper film, he can jump on a car. He's very good. And when then we asked him, that, can you just turn one degree more? And he does this. Can you make it further, closer, faster, slower? pigeons yeah. on pigeons and he does all these amazing things to you so it's very much thanks to this team uh -huh. and the two he's also called max so yeah. we have the amazing. mad max and the fast max and these two guys are behind this film very much i see but so then how many times did you how many takes did you did you have uh we had a lot of test takes, okay. rehearsal takes, uh -huh. and uh, this is all shot in the blue hour, in the yeah. early morning. So I would just tell you that in August, this uh, past year, I yeah. was waking up at three every second day. So we had a lot, a lot of preparation, but the actual shooting was happening uh, during three mornings. Okay. And every day it was supposed to be two to three takes because of the traffic limitations yeah. after certain hours that are just too many cars and because of um, the time and light. But on the third day, we didn't make it. So we were supposed to have roughly nine takes, mm -hmm. but uh, on the last day, you we're spoiling it, but there is this uh, St. Michael Square and St. Michael Cathedral, yeah. and there are some tanks and they got mined, they got reported to be mined, and we were just stopped by the police and not allowed to film. So we just lost one day, basically. So eventually, it was two shooting mornings, yeah. and we had six takes, three were technical mistakes, four were okay, but out of those four, just one was good, and it's a film. Yeah. Well, there is obviously a sense of urgency the situation um, in which the film is made but through um, this speed like this urgency kind of um, transcends itself and it and it really uh, spills into yeah I would say emotional domains um, and as as a as a viewer of the film it was it was like absolutely breathtaking like you know like sometimes you when there is like a sudden like turn with the car then i'm like oh my god like you know and like i'm jumping back on my seat and everything because i'm like oh my god now we're gonna like crash or i don't know it really brought back like i think maybe something from cinema that could have been there in the very beginning when this was a very new medium and when people were not really accustomed to it and maybe didn't really understand how it works you know like this um very famous anecdotes of people running out of the cinema and the train was coming on the screen and everything like it kind of brings you back to that experience of 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 cinema was this on your mind when you made this film um and how would you reflect on this sense of urgency that is so important to the film to me Lelouch's film is mesmerizing exactly because of that, because it's very, very simple in a way. It's just yeah. a car driving and nothing else. But uh, maybe the way I conceptualize it, it's, of course, motion, because cinema is motion pictures and movement, motion. The character yeah. of the motion is just mesmerizing. I think we are programmed to react to motion biologically there is like something in our back brain that responds to it and yeah, we're just animals in that sense it's danger risk hunting some hunter in us responds to this 
But also the second important part to me is the city and the landscape and the things you described when a turn, yeah. a shift is like a script shift. So the story is the landscape and the landscape tells you how events unfold and it tells you, it narrates, the narrative lies in the landscape. I think I'm rather mesmerized by that quality of the city and the space. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that happened in the early cinema, uh, not so much because they were not so equipped yeah. technically for these long takes. And this is, so this is both this effect of the cinema, the early cinema, yeah. but maybe the essence of cinema to yeah. be mesmerized, but also the beautiful moment we're mm -hmm. living in now when it Okay, I was also wondering about it that uh, obviously, and I also explained that um, content-wise, um, like you kind of um, queered this narrative, so to speak, um, but obviously not only a narrative or a story being told can be queer, but also the way in which a story is being told or, or like formally we can... Um, maybe rethink cinema through different lands. To what extent would you consider it's a date as a, as a queer film, as a product of queer filmmaking? Honestly, it's a very difficult question to mm. me as an author, because I almost feel like this film does not belong to me and I'm not the one to judge. Like I'm some kind of medium who had to make it, but then it has its own life. And I'm just curious to see what other people say, what people who are maybe specialists in queer cinema or just mm -hmm. viewers or people who are in love with queer cinema. Uh, I would say that it's an important film politically especially in Ukraine, because as I said, that same-sex partnerships are not legal and yeah. it's really burning now and some partnerships are broken by the war and one of the partners risks losing their life defending Ukraine. So it has to me a political meaning in the sense, but in terms of cinema language, I might argue that it's a very simple film. It's uh, not too queer in a way that, uh, as we discussed, it's just very um, essentially mm -hmm. cinematic, if that makes sense. So maybe on the contrary, paradoxically, it's not a very queer film, but I'm not a specialist and I'm just very open to all kinds of interpretations. Yeah, maybe that simplicity can read in a certain queer way. I think, I think it could be possible but yeah but it's interesting that you say and i very much agree with this very um i don't know viscerally cinematic experience that the that the film provides yeah well thank you so much for for taking the time for us um, and talking about the film thank you for the film as well it really was uh, a joy to watch thank see you, you soon at berlinale